we are officially kicking off with a soft rollout, because this is all it is, the whole idea of the Tennessee Score Institute. Why an institute? Because it gives us a more formal forum like tonight to continue the grunt work, the hard work of changing the culture of education in a way that we can all achieve what we want to achieve. And so the Tennessee Score Institute will be a series of discussions, uh, with this being the first over the next year, over the next two years, where with your ideas, your input, we will have people to celebrate the past a little bit, but most importantly, look, look to the future. We're proud that this first program features Governor Phil Bredesen and Sir Michael Barber and that all of you are here joining us, more than 70 thought leaders from across the state and indeed from, from around the country, bringing the, the very best and, and the brightest and hopefully the most common sense into the room together is really what we're all about. It's what we're all about as SCORE. It's what all we're about as elected officials, as philanthropists, as educators, as representatives of, of teachers all coming uh, together. Being here this evening with uh, Sir Michael is, uh, Sir Michael Barber is, um, uh, it kind of closes a circle for me in a way. I had been going religiously to the Hunt Institute over in North Carolina. Former Governor Jim Hunt has put these things together um, to learn a little bit. It's a couple of days and there'll be four or five governors there and they bring a bunch of very prominent people in to have a chance to talk uh, and learn a lot. The thing that I took out of that, that whole meeting, was the importance of standards and the importance of being, first of all, like in any management problem, of just setting down and saying what it is you expect and what it is you want and being clear about it. Uh, and then you can start talking about how you move ahead and get those kinds of things. I went to school in a very small town, most of you know, in upstate New York. My high school graduating class was 39 people. Um, and when I went from there to Harvard as the first person from the town who'd ever gone to any Ivy League college, it was the culture shock of a lifetime, believe me. But there was something about that school. Okay? And the answer is, the answer was standards. That at every level, in the teachers, uh, in the principal of that school, they were just bears on standards. So let's begin at the beginning. You've got a fantastic vision in your uh, uh, application that uh, the US Department has, uh, has agreed to spend uh, uh, all those dollars uh, helping you with. You've got fantastic ambition, not just in the plan, but represented in the room and all the people we've met during the day. Uh, it's a great proposal, um, and you're rightly proud of it. Uh, but how does it compare to the world's best systems? The governor mentioned the importance of standards. All the great systems in the world, the truly world-class systems, set standards. And then they don't just write them on paper. Those standards appear exactly as the governor described in his own high school. They appear in every classroom, in every school, uh, in the organization. You know, I, I was a high school teacher long ago, um, a history teacher. And I used to teach my ch students. Uh, I'd teach them a lesson, British history, American history, whatever it was. And some of them would learn that lesson, and some of them wouldn't learn it. And then I'd go on and teach the next lesson. And then I'd go on and teach the next lesson. And some of the kids would learn it and some of them wouldn't. And when they didn't learn it, I said, well, he doesn't do his homework. His family's not interested in education. Uh, or he doesn't try hard enough. Or he doesn't like history. I didn't say, how can I change my teaching to make sure that he learns and she learns and he learns. All of them get to the standards. But in the great systems, everybody gets to the standard. When a child falls behind, somebody does something about it. Now, it's easy in... Um, politics and I'm in, the, in a room with some of the, uh, the masters of the art so I say this with some hesitation it's easy in politics to think that getting the policy right is 90% and implementation is the kind of 10% that will be taken care of afterwards I see this with governments all the time back home all around the world tough though it was to get where you've got to the bigger challenge is the challenge that lies ahead the challenge of getting it done to make it happen, like it said on that track, or what we called in the Blair administration, the challenge of delivery. What you represent here is the center of this circle. You are the guiding coalition. You're the people overseeing what happens uh, with this race to the top proposal. As a result of the work of Senator Frist and many of the rest of you, you now have a guiding coalition of people who, in their bones, know what's in that plan, who believe in the objective, who will never be deflected from it. 
But over time, you've got to build those circles, what we call ever-widening circles of leadership. You've got to take it into the communities. You've got to take it out into all the 134 districts or, or however many it is. You've got to get the system leaders committee. You've got to communicate it through the system and then beyond because we know uh, uh, as a result of uh, democracy, a wonderful thing, governments change. So leaders change, but the aspirations of parents and families, they don't change. They have to believe in your agenda. So the ever widening circles of leadership need to go out through the state starting uh, from the guiding coalition that's in this room. Um, let me finish uh, by saying this. That is a picture. Um, I won't impose many of my uh, photographs on you, but this is a photograph of Annapurna uh, in Nepal. The story of the first ascent of Annapurna, it was the first 8,000 meter peak ever climbed uh, in 1950 by a French team led by a man called Maurice Herzog. The story of it is absolutely awesome. He gets to the top with one colleague from a group of six. The others are way down at a, a sort of midway up camp. And then on the way down, um, quite near the top, he drops a glove, Morris Herzog, and just slides away down the mountain. But he's at 23,000 feet. So his fingers start freezing up. They get slow. The other guy's ill. They get delayed. Uh, they finally stagger back to their colleagues, and then they get helped down, and they... Uh, lose some fingers and toes. Um, it all gets a bit gruesome, but they get back, and Maurice Herzog is well enough to write a fantastic book of this story. And the very last line of the book, which is almost my parting remark, but not quite, he says, there are other Annapurnas in the lives of people. And I think that's a very profound thought to finish that story with. And to me, your, your Race to the Top proposal is your collective Annapurna. You've got to climb a mountain. As a result of your extraordinary efforts over the last year or so, I think um, you've done really well to arrive at base camp in really good order. You've got all the equipment you need. You've got the morale you need. You're ready uh, for the assault on the summit. But what I want to tell you uh, and leave you with is the part ahead is the harder part of that. You've got the courage and you've got the capacity to head for the summit. And if you remember over the next few years, and we'll help reminding you, that implementation is 90% of everything, I think you really will be first to the top. Thank you very much for your time.